Hello, welcome to Station 17's broadcast brought to you by Olivia, Brooke, Callan, Michelle, and Quinn. Today we'll be talking about World War II. First off, the establishment of the United Nations. Hello everybody, my name is Quinn Marchetti and I am on the air today to tell you about the recent event that will go down not just in United States history, but in world history forever. The establishment of the United Nations. Back in January of 1942, our very own President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, along with leaders from 26 other nations, pledged their allegiance to continue fighting together against the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, in what was called the Declaration by United Nations. The old League of Nations, created in 1919 by former President Thomas Woodrow Wilson, was created to end the First World War and prevent further warfare. However, at the start of the Second World War, we learned that it didn't really work. It only provided a baseline for international conflict resolution and negotiating peace between nations. But as all of you know, in times like we are in now, when the world is divided, we need a better way of solving world issues. President Roosevelt agreed. So he, along with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and leader of Soviet Russia Joseph Stalin, got together in San Francisco this past April with representatives from 50 other nations at the United Nations Conference on International Organization to write the United Nations Charter, which is a way to solve all types of conflict throughout the world. The United Nations Charter was signed this past June by all 50 nations that were at the conference, and the United Nations finally came into existence recently on the 24th day in October in the year 1945, after the Charter was ratified by the United Kingdom, the United States, China, France, the Soviet Union, and many other nations creating a new, efficient way to solve world issues. Now that the war is over, negotiating and maintaining peace throughout the world will be part of the responsibility of the United Nations Security Council, comprised of representatives from the United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, and the Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a big deal for mankind. It is a new way to keep the peace within all the nations of the world, to avoid conflict, and if it does happen, to resolve it peacefully. Thank you all for listening, and have a great day. Next, we are going to discuss neutrality in the Second World War, especially that of Switzerland and Sweden, and ask ourselves if true neutrality is ever actually achieved. But first, a little history of the two countries. Switzerland became a nation of neutrality following the Vienna Conference of 1815 due to post-Napoleon international relations. In 1920, Switzerland asked for a confirmation of its neutrality prior to entering the League of Nations. Switzerland was ready to embrace a spirit of neutrality when World War II began, even whilst other nations violated the official rules set on neutral Switzerland. Both the Axis powers and the Allies disrespected Swiss airspace. However, many Swiss bankers and war material manufacturers found loopholes with regulations in regards to Nazi Germany. Swiss federal counselor Max Petitpierre has stated, These credits in the deliveries of war material and other products contributed to the war efforts of one of the belligerents. Not only have we abandoned integral neutrality, but even worse, in doing so, we were as a rule deviating from the very notion of neutrality. Were these pursued loopholes merely reflecting those power-hungry in business, or an entire country proclaimed neutral between the globe's fighting powers? Like Switzerland, Sweden's neutrality has been in effect since the early 19th century, and it's a very controversial issue. Sweden shipped iron ore to supply the war effort in Nazi Germany. It was because of this that the Allies launched Operation Wilfred and the Norwegian Campaign in 1940. However, this British naval blockade failed to stop the Nazis from obtaining the Swedish iron they needed. With this in mind, is it fair to say that either of these countries were neutral? Both used the war to their benefit. Switzerland maintained its neutrality to protect its own banking interests from plundering by the Axis powers and relied on German-imported coal during the war. Additionally, Swiss soldiers shot down Allied planes to appease the Germans and opened fire on Axis bombers invading their airspace. The Swiss had formed complex fortifications and gathered soldiers to prevent an invasion by Germany. Sweden had prepared to fight at the end of the war with the Allies if Norway and Denmark didn't accept a German armistice. So is it fair to say a neutral agenda was maintained here? Perhaps neutrality, like all things, is not absolute. For an entire week, starting on the night of July 24th, an aerial bombing attack was carried out on the city of Hamburg, Germany. It was called Operation Gourmet. 
British's Royal Air Force teamed up with the United States' Air Force to complete an around-the-clock attack. The Royal Air Force attacked at night with the goal of destroying Germany's second-largest city as means of weakening the emotional stability of Germans. Using a new technique, they dropped strips of foil which blurred and distracted radar systems, allowing Britain easy access into the city. The first night, 2,000 tons of explosives were dropped on the city. Due to the dry conditions in the city and the sheer amount of the bombs, massive fire bro fires broke out throughout the city. The next day, during the day, the U.S. took to the air as they targeted Hamburg shipyards and ports, which housed submarines. These submarines were wreaking havoc in the Atlantic and destroying ships. The U.S. and the United States was heavily attacked by fighter pilots and guns from below, but they were still able to carry out the attack even with the clouds of smoke they faced from the fires the night before. Additionally, the U.S. also succeeded in, drawing, in destroying oil supplies, airplane engine factories, military target bases, rendering them useless, along with targeting military, industrial, and economic systems, and to remove any potential threats. Hamburg was convenient and close to Britain, making the air raid easy to complete. The second night, the Royal Air Force's bombings created severe firestorms, leaving the city burning and encapsulated in smoke. Tornadoes of 1,500-foot walls of fire were produced. In total, four attacks by Britain and two air raids by the United States were carried out. This Allied victory came at a high cost for Germany, with 42,600 deaths and another 3,700 injured civilians. Attention all listeners, breaking news. This is an update on the German siege of Leningrad. But first I will recap what has occurred so far. Hitler saw Leningrad as the home of communism, so he wanted to destroy the city to destroy communism. On June 22, 1941, the Germans invaded Leningrad as part of their Barbarossa operation. German forces occupied the point on the Neva River, where it flows out of Lake Ladoga. This effectively cut off Leningrad from the Soviet interior. Hitler ordered his troops to fire guns and airstrikes at the city, and they would not accept surrender if it was offered. Many civilians of all ages are doing their best to put up a good defensive fight, but there's limited weapons and they have li very little training. The people of Leningrad are cut off from outside supplies and many are starving. Rations keep getting cut to smaller and smaller amounts, and by now they are below the starvation levels. Around 2.5 million civilians are hungry, and there is just not enough food to go around. The soldiers are getting priority for food because they are the ones fighting. The Soviets have attempted to rebuild rail lines, but they have been bombed. A route across Lake Ladoga was used for a short while, but that was bombed too, and there was a shortage of fuel. Stalin has ordered the Soviets to be on the offensive and attack the German lines. That worked a little, but the Germans quickly, quickly regathered themselves. The good thing to come out of this was that while the attacks were going on, authorities were able to get 850,000 civilians out of Leningrad. This past summer, the Soviets quietly built pipelines and electronic cables under Lake Dodoga. Soviet forces were able to gather themselves and attack the Germans. The Germans were not expecting this and were outnumbered, but Hitler would not pull back. So it is official. The Soviets have just successfully pushed back the Germans. This has ended the 900-day siege on Leningrad, making this a huge win for us and a big defeat on our fascist enemies. Stay tuned for more on the war. Hi, my name is Brooke, and I'll be reporting for the final segment of this broadcast today. I think it's very important that we all take some time to address the Japanese atrocities that affected our Eastern Hemisphere. The Japanese are trying to hide and distort these atrocities from the rest of the world, so it's time to shed some light on the truth of the matter. The war crimes committed by the Japanese were as inhumane as it gets. The mass amount of murders are astounding, but the method in which each person is murdered is perhaps even more astounding. These murders were often so distasteful and humiliating that for the interest of our listeners, we will not spend time discussing the details of these violent acts. However, let's take a look at Lu Shun. Lu Shun is a city in China where 30,000 Chinese were massacred by the Japanese in November of 1894. Lu Shun is one of many examples where the Chinese were victimized by Japan. Another example is the Nanjing Massacre. The Nanjing Massacre occurred in late 1937. Japan attacked the Chinese city of Nanjing and went after both soldiers and civilians there. Hundreds of thousands were brutally murdered in that one city. 
On top of that, it is estimated that tens of thousands of women were sexually assaulted. It is unknown how many of those women faced their assault right before their death and how many had to live and persevere past that trauma. Also, Japanese troops were committing crimes on their way to the city of Nanjing. As if they were doing it for sport, Japanese troops partook in killing contests and pillaging. Once they did arrive, however, infants and elderly people were not excused from their cruel games. On top of the damage Japan made on the people of China, they also managed to burn down almost one-third of the buildings in Nanjing. Calling the Japanese relentless would be an understatement. Nanjing was one of many cities in places such as China that Japan had targeted. It's hard to compare these events to many other things since Japan was so extreme and so cruel. This short segment hardly did these atrocities any justice, but at least we get to talk about them. That's all we have time for today. Try to have a good day now, everybody. This is Station 17 signing off.